winner of the Kayla for film and television impact. But Jesus, this one's yours, the chosen. Well, why do you think The Chosen? It has universal appeal. It has been a huge hit. It's such an easy thing to watch. The Chosen is the largest crowdfunded TV show to date. Well, the Bible is complicated and sometimes hard to understand, but watching The Chosen has really broken down Jesus and truly who he is. Made the Bible so alive. We both know that God is telling this story and we're just trying to find it. I learned from The Chosen. I watched them every night. I learned uh, that seeing something is far more powerful than reading something, reading about something. I'm making a show about Jesus mm -hmm. where 95% of the content isn't from the Bible. It doesn't matter whether or not it's, whether or not it's factually accurate. Jesus? Jesus. Yeah. No, 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 no. I have seen almost every episode of The Chosen. I was very hesitant to watch The Chosen. I actually have not watched The Chosen. I, I watched one episode halfway. Personally? I love The Chosen. And honestly, I've watched every episode about three times. Uh, it, it's, it's very intense. I mean, seriously, and just to be honest to you, I mean, I was in tears. It, it just blew my mind. I mean, just to think about, you know, these kids hanging out with Jesus, like the, the, the king of the universe, what would that be like? Everybody says that it, you know, makes them feel like they're actually in the Bible. It makes the Bible seem more real to them. I feel like I can relate to him more, and I know many people have been impacted by the show in the same way I have. And so I decided, well, I'm gonna check this out. Of course, very leery. And along the way, you hear some things that you don't quite agree with. Over time, there were certain scenes that really began to kind of not sit right with me. I, I thought, that there were certain scenes that misportrayed Jesus or misportrayed some of the other characters and it was putting this imagery inside of my mind. So I think we need to be very, very careful with tinkering with the model of who Jesus is. That imagery of our Savior being printed into people's minds. Dallas Jenkins claims that there is no churches that influence what he's creating in The Chosen. As I've said many, many times, the content of the show has zero influence or input from any formal faith tradition or church. None. Which is fascinating because in this next clip, they have Jesus saying something right out of Mormon writings. If you do not renounce your words, we will have no choice but to follow the law of Moses. I am the law of Moses. See, this is the tricky thing because Jesus is the law. He is the law and the prophets. He is the word. The word is him. But when you get an exact phrase like this that didn't come out of the Bible, where did it come from? When Jesus says, I am the law, you can't find that in the Bible. Nephi chapter 15 and verse 9 says, Behold, I am the law and the light. Look unto me and endure to the end. And you might ask, what's wrong with that? Isn't Jesus the embodiment of the law? Well, yes, but as you see in a moment, this has a problematic undercurrent. In the scene, Jesus is trying to help the Pharisees understand that he is the fulfillment of the law. But if the overarching theme in the whole series is that your behavior is not important, then in the context of what he says there, then whatever comes out of the mouth of Jesus, or the character of Jesus, becomes the truth reinterpreted. You know, Jesus clearly said in the Gospels, Do not think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Even a website devoted to Latter-day Saints says this about The Chosen. 
Latter-day Saints are involved with the show. The Chosen is distributed by Angel Studios, which was co-founded by Latter-day Saints brothers Neil and Jeffrey Harmon. The show was allowed to film on the church's recreated set of Ancient Jerusalem for the episodes and its Christmas special. Latter-day Saints are also on the crew. Daryl Eves is one of the Latter-day Saints executive producers on the show. He gave an interview to LDS Living in January 2022 discussing his relationship with Jenkins and the show. In fact, there's more than one executive producer that is Mormon. And these guys do a lot more than just executive produce the show. Are there multiple ex executive producers or one or <laughs> how does that work? It's, it's a title that gets used for many different purposes okay. in the entertainment world. Okay. okay. So I happen to be an executive producer who actually works on productions and running the business of The Chosen. Okay. Um, other executive producers that are listed there, well, Daryl is an executive producer, but he also plays another role. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a term that is used broadly in the industry. I think there's a lot of intrigue to understand the relationship, is the relationship between The Chosen and the Latter-day Saint community and the evangelical community, or sometimes referred to as traditional Christians right. and Latter-day Saints. Um, what I would love to do is ask both of you, where you got involved, how it all began for you, how did you meet Dallas Jenkins, the whole story of how both of you got connected to the chosen story. That both Brad and Daryl are LDS. Yes. And so that's oh, sure, why sure. this is unique to have this conversation and for them to be involved in something that, that maybe started out as an evangelical thing, but as God has worked through it, it has become everyone who wants to have a relationship with Christ is, is really yep experiencing a wonderful thing and and like you said people that don't even know christ yeah yeah was there any initial conversation of like wait i'm evangelical you're lds just at the very beginning yeah there? um i i do believe that dallas um had a lot of people telling him that he would be crazy to uh start a business with with uh, someone that's lds and a just you know someone um distributing it that is LDS. Right. So the LDS church is very involved and very invested in the production of The Chosen. Although Dallas Jenkins is not LDS, he defends their beliefs. I'll always be eternally indebted to him because of how he's defended me and my beliefs. And on the flip side, he will say other things, you know, of how we've helped him, you know, and it's just been very synergistic. Yeah. Yeah. of a project. Dallas Jenkins, the director, is going to be very cautious with how he talks about Mormonism because he's borrowing their stuff. What about the Goshen set that the LDS church owns? And um, I, I had some familiarity with that set and the people who managed it really said, let's, let's just go drive out and look at this set. 72 hours later, we received word that we were going to be able to use the set. Um, and it, it, it truly was miraculous. Even other people at the church were calling Daryl and I saying, how did you do that? <laughs> you know, we can't even get our own church productions on that set during this period of time, but yeah. we were able to do that. So the question remains, is there any influence on the chosen from the Mormon church? You have Dallas seemingly talking out of both sides of his mouth. A growing brother and sisterhood with people of the LDS community that I never would have known otherwise and learning so much about um about your your faith tradition the stories of jesus we do agree on and we we love the same jesus we have to be really careful when we say hey we all love the same jesus well which one you know is it really the same jesus if you have a mormon jesus who is literally the brother of satan that's not the jesus that i love so Jesus being a created being is what the Mormon church believes. Uh, that's not what the Bible teaches at all. In fact, John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We must worship God in spirit and in truth. And just because his name is Jesus, and he looks like Jesus, sounds like Jesus, is it truly the same Jesus? We know that there's coming an antichrist spirit that's going to look a lot like Jesus, sound, just like Jesus, but it's that subtle deception that's going to deceive the entire world. The Bible says that the dragon will deceive the entire world. Is doctrine important in the Bible? John 17, 17 says, if anyone wills to do his will, 
He shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether it be I speak of my own authority. This is Jesus commenting, saying, doctrine is important. So it's very interesting to me that the guy that plays Jesus is a Roman Catholic and very vocal about his Roman Catholicism. He has an app called Halo that he's constantly promoting for people to join. I'm your guide on Halo, a prayer and meditation app to help you find peace. Take a deep breath in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is a picture of Jesus being stamped into the public's mind and him just naturally being Catholic is going to make people, they're going to be more sympathetic to that. St. Padre Pio said the greatest weapon against the devil we have is the rosary. Try it. Dallas is actually sitting here in St. Peter's Square with Jonathan. Dallas is the director. And there's a lot of idols. Catholicism has saints that, that people actually pray to or hold things that they hold holy. I believe that Protestants have gone too far in the opposite direction and become almost skeptical of art and skeptical of imagery because they don't want to be idolatrous and because they don't want to be so symbolic that, that you miss out on truth of what's being said, that these relics feel like idols to some Protestants. And I've come to believe, well, we Protestants, I think, have missed out on some truly great opportunities to be artistic. And as an artist myself, I'm like, yeah, I, I do that. I, I, I create symbols sometimes in my work. I create metaphor. I think that there's danger in both sides. I think both sides can become, one can become too idolatrous, one can become too dismissive. And yeah. I don't think either Two of answers. us are in, in, no, I don't any, think so either. in that camp. On but, the, but, but, and I've grown to over the years, like when I first used to come to these places, I would, I would show up and I'd be like, this feels wrong to me. Mm. And now that I know so many more of Catholic brothers and sisters who I believe share the same passion for Jesus that I do and just have a different worship approach and style, I go, okay, I, I can see, I see, I do see it differently. But the commandment specifically says, do not bow yourselves down to any images. In Exodus 24 and 5, it says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is under the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting in the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. God is very clear for us to have nothing to do with idolatry. In fact, when you look at the Bible, look at how many times Israel was tripped up over and over and over again because of idolatry. So this is alarming to me that Dallas would even be coming at this kind of perspective of just, we need to relax a little bit in this area. Also Catholics worship saints, especially Virgin Mary. He's one of the prayers that they pray to Mary. Rejoice, good will of God to us sinners. Rejoice, strong defender of those who repent before God for their sins. <laughs> Rejoice, mediator of all to God. Does this sound right? You who cleanse us from the defilement of sin? Mary cleans us? Mediator of all to God? But let me tell you, the Bible is so clear in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God, one mediator, between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, not Mary. Really? Does this sound like simply asking Mary to pray for us? If this is not idolatry, so what is? This is the picture of Jonathan Rumi who plays Jesus in Chosen. This is a Facebook post visiting Saint Padre Pio, one of the most powerful saints and witnesses to the suffering and the miracles of Christ in the 20th century, as well as one with whom I have personal interaction and saying that he has had personal interactions with this saint who died before this guy was even born this is straight up necromancy this is forbidden in the bible because you cannot communicate with the dead all right so there's christianity and then there's spiritualism a christian is someone who follows christ the resurrection and the life a spiritualist well they seek to communicate with spirits of the dead and those two belief systems cannot blend together. One of the main reasons is because God himself specifically tells his followers to stay away from spiritualism, even going to the point of saying that those who engage in it, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
When Jonathan, the actor from The Chosen, sat down with Dallas Jenkins, the director of The Chosen, with the director of the Jesus Revolution movie, the discussion was very interesting because you hear them talk about the universalism or the ecumenicalism of bringing all these faiths together. What, what do you most want people to get out of it when they see this movie? Like you want them to walk out of Jesus Revolution uh, thinking or feeling what? What I would hope is that this inspires their curiosity. Maybe if they're from a different, uh, you know, denomination to kind of see that, um, how, how uh, ecumenical this movement was uh, because it affected so many different kinds of Christians. He actually went and sought out where Lonnie Frisbee was buried. And this was scary what he did. Before I started work, I went over to Christ Cathedral and uh, I, I sat by his grave and I prayed a rosary with him. I sat down and I prayed with him. Um, the, the, the space just to his right is empty. So I got to sit down or lie. At one point I even lied down because I just thought it would be kind of interesting to try to connect in some way. That's probably more information than you need or may even want to publish. But that said, uh, I, you know, I, it's the truth. And so I finished praying with him and I said, Lonnie, I want to honor you with this film. And I really want to, um, to, to, to bring justice and, and, you know, the testament to the gifts of God's grace and, and powers that you, you know, displayed while you were on this earth. And so if this is a good idea that I do this film, have somebody give me a sign. Give me a sign, have God give me a sign. And the minute the words left my mouth, behind me there was a door open to the cathedral and this giant chord rang out for about five seconds. And then- From started. the organ? From the organ. Wow. I hadn't heard it before. And that's the very organ that used to be there when it was the, it's the same organ that really? when it was the Crystal Cathedral. Mm -hmm. It was sent out and refurbished and whatnot, but it's the same one. So I heard that and I was like, okay, thanks for that. <laughs> when you're asking and you know, and you're not asking God, you're asking a dead person, you're literally telling the spirit world, hey, I want you to show me something. Show me something that's going to convince me. And he got that answer. When he heard the organ play, he was like, all right, thank you for that. Who was he thanking? He wasn't thanking a dead man. He's been dead for years but he was actually thanking the demons that gave him the sign. Jesus actually said that it's an adulterous and wicked nation that looks for signs and wonders. I'm wearing a mantle and a cross with a little crown on it, uh, a knight's cross. Uh, five years ago, I was uh, knighted by the order, the uh, solemn uh, sovereign military order of the Temple of Jerusalem. I lost my mind there for a second. Um, essentially, the Knights Templar, which is what that is. If you don't know who the Knights Templar is, look at the structure of Freemasonry. The Knights Templar is literally the top step. It is on par with a 33rd degree Freemason. In fact, you can't get any higher, well, at least any higher than they tell us you can get, than a 33rd degree Freemason or a Knights Templar. So Blavatsky said that the modern versions of the Templars were actually inspired and influenced by the Jesuits to try to Christianize what the Templars actually believe. And of course, especially those flavors that are connected with Freemasonry. Now, when you have Freemasons and Jesuits orchestrating and directing a Christian movie or a Christian series infiltrating, and now they are running the world's largest, most viewed, Christian entertainment of all time. That is alarming. On his Instagram, which was dated in 2020, it says, it was an epic inaugural event and on behalf of my fellow Templar brothers and sisters, we are so grateful to have been a part of it. The guy who is stamping Jesus in everybody's mind is literally on par with the 33rd degree Freemason. Scully, Maury, and Mary, that's Mary there. Our Lady Guadalupe. So, 
dynamic duo, yeah? Why do you have a symbol of death on your fingers? We should be separating ourselves from things that are glamorizing death and destruction and evil in any kind of way. Somebody had commented on The Chosen's actual official Facebook and said this, Repent, Dallas and Jonathan, of your blasphemy and twisting of the scriptures. Repent of your Freemasonry and your promotion of your true God, Lucifer. And look at what they wrote at the top. They wrote, no. What am I supposed to think about an answer like that? If somebody says, hey, you need to repent of this and that and their false accusations, I'm not just gonna say no. I would address them and tell them every reason why this is a false accusation. If you're wondering who the Freemasons really truly follow, there is a book called Morals and Dogma written by Albert Pike. And on page 321, this is what it says. Lucifer the light bearer, strange and mysterious name given to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, it is he who brings the light, he who bears the light, and with its splendor, intolerable blinds, feeble, sensual, and selfish souls. Doubt it not. One of the highest ranking Freemasons, Albert Pike, wrote that in this book, and that ought to tell you who they really truly worship. It has been a huge hit. It's such an easy thing to watch. Like, it compl the Bible's complicated and sometimes hard to understand, but watching The Chosen has really broken down Jesus and truly who he is. The Bible can be hard to understand, but listen to what it says about itself. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But we also have the assurance from God's Word that if you do want to understand, God's promise to you is that he will give you wisdom. This is what it says in James. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. We've, we've developed a trust in each other that uh, uh, I, I feel like we're on the same, like it's not a marriage, but it's like, I feel like there's like a, God, ha we, we, we both know that God is telling this story and mm -hmm. we're just trying to find it. But didn't God already write this story? We have the Bible, which is literally the words of God. We want to introduce the authentic Jesus to a billion people. And I believe the show is, is, is kind of an unvarnished look at the authentic Jesus. I'm making a show about Jesus mm -hmm. where 95% of the content isn't from the Bible. Most of the content of this show is not directly from scripture. I know that sounds horrible, but it's true. If you watched episode one of season one, almost none of that is from scripture. If you watch episode two of season two, none of it is from scripture. Episode three, none of it from scripture. Episode four, most of it not from scripture. I think when they see this version of Jesus portrayed, he has his own flaws in a human way. Like he's very relatable and, um, and gracious. And I think people need to see that, that side of Jesus, because we've a lot of us have been force-fed, um, you know, a, a version of Jesus that only cares about our behaviors. Every episode, the story pushes back on that. This version of Jesus they want to see created on screen completely misses the gospel. You see, Jesus knows where you are at. He can identify. The Bible says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Another thing that I think is a very subtle undercurrent here is the way that Jesus underplays rules. It is right there in the book of Moses. If a man takes his brother's wife, it is impurity. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. I understand this against the law of Moses, but I'm here for bigger purposes than the breaking of rules. You minimize incest? John pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Only a spotless, perfect Lamb could be the sacrifice good enough to pay the price of sin, not a flawed lamb. And let's be clear, sin is a behavior. It's also a heart condition. Jesus came to die for all of our behavior and all of our hearts. To think that after he dies, he doesn't think about our behavior is completely missing the gospel. He died to restore in us his image so that we don't sin anymore. 
When Christ comes into the life, we are transformed and we are a new creation. And our old selves, our old behaviors, those pass away. The Bible says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former loss, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. You see, this is God's ideal for our lives. That's what he wants for all of his children. The music connection here is very interesting. If you go back a little in history, you know that when Pope John Paul II came to the US and did a tour in 1999, it was very ecumenical. And guess who was there to welcome the Pope with all the Catholics? Jars of Clay, who Dan Hasseltine sings for. The stories we tell about Jesus are not very compelling. There are certainly a lot of things that are plausible. Where we can get into trouble is deciding what questionable factual information goes into a story. When we read the Bible, we certainly imagine scenes and characters in a way that maybe no one else does. When we watch the story as someone else has imagined it, it has the potential to affect our thinking. And that can be a slippery slope. We have to be very careful with the motives and beliefs of those who are crafting the story. Matthew Nelson is an interesting guy. He has a lot of Buddhist ideas on his website. You can see from his Instagram page, he's very into Buddhism. So on Matthew Nelson's website, he has a quote from Alan Watts, and it says the Zen gardener is not interfering with nature because he is nature. He cultivates as if not cultivating, thus the garden is at once highly artificial and extremely natural. I think the irony here is that Buddhism is a religion of works. You essentially earn your salvation by your behavior. But that idea is completely at odds with Christianity. You see, Jesus is the only one who can offer salvation. You can't earn that. You can't pay for that. Only the perfect Son of God can offer that. On his Instagram page, you can see him posting a picture of a martini glass full of vodka. And he says, the Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. That's quite blasphemous in my book. So I think it's worthy of mentioning that in this chosen series, we have the same message that Hollywood pushes over and over and over again. The follow your heart message. Is the kingdom of God really coming? What does your heart tell you? What does your heart tell you? But see, the Bible actually warns us against following our heart. In Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? This is a, a feel-good way of saying, do what thou wilt, follow your heart. That was Aleister Crowley's number one and only law of Satanism. There are some serious, subtle things that get put into the dialogue. And if you're not paying attention, it seems like it could sound like it's coming straight from the Bible, but here's an example of that. A kingdom that is coming soon. Or yes, sorrow and sighing will flee away. I make a way for people to access that kingdom. I make a way for people to access that kingdom. So to say that Jesus is making a way instead of the way, because that's what the Bible says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. That is the way, the only way. When you say a way, that leaves the door open for, well, can it be Buddhist? Can it be any of these other faith religions? I think it's a really exciting time for faith-based media, particularly film and television. So it's, I think it's getting ready to explode. I think we're kind of like, at the beginning of a movement. Yeah. Let that be your warning. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that Time put on the cover of their magazine in 1966, Is God Dead, tells me that the pendulum had swung all the way to the left. People are doing drugs, homosexuality is raging, and nobody cares about God. 
And that time, people are ripe for a revival. And then just a few years later, in 1971, the pendulum swings all the way to the other side with a Jesus revolution, and all of a sudden they put Jesus on the cover of Time magazine. And they're equating that to what's going on today. People are swinging all the way to the left, forgetting God, be living their lives however they want to, and they're primed and ready to literally accept a form of godliness. I don't think it is by chance that Jonathan Rumi was asked to play Lonnie Frisbee in the movie called Jesus Revolution. What is a revolution? It is a forcible overthrow of a government or social order in favor of a new system. Combining the terms Jesus and revolution together is an oxymoron. And Jesus didn't come to overthrow government. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. He didn't come to overthrow social order in favor of a new system. He already created the correct system, and he came to restore that. The mission of Jesus is best described in the Gospels, and she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The only one who started a revolution was God's enemy, Satan. Lonnie Frisbee was an actual mess in life. Uh, this guy that, that he's portraying in the movie, Lonnie, he was uh, open homosexual. He, he died of AIDS. He was, he was using LSD, smoking marijuana, and there was no message of repentance. In fact, he did drugs even when he was preaching. Um, he never left the homosexuality movement. His marriage was constantly in trouble. So it's strange that they're taking the picture of what's being stamped in everybody's mind, Jesus, and then now all of a sudden he's playing this character that, that has some really bad behaviors and characteristics in his life. This movie is being shared around in a lot of Christian circles and people are excited about there being a revival, which I think is, is a great thing. There, there literally is uh, people who need Jesus right now and I hope that everybody has a chance to come to Jesus. But they're stamping this image of a revival in everybody's mind that has nothing to do with your obedience. That's going to be a problem. We know that there is going to be a great religious awakening in the end of the world. But the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2.9 that right before that huge awakening happens, that there is a false awakening that happens. Listen to what the verse says. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The Bible tells us that there will be a lie, a deception that's coming, and that deception is going to be of a religious order. And how do we know how to distinguish between whether that's of God or whether that's of Satan is literally this. It's the coming of the lawless one, someone that doesn't follow the law, someone that delights in wickedness, someone that says it doesn't matter what you do in your life, all you gotta do is believe in Jesus and you will be saved, that's it. In Revelation, we see a beast, which in Bible prophecy represents a king or a kingdom. But there is something different about this king or kingdom. It's of a religious order. How do we know? Well, it has a name of blasphemy. It speaks things in blasphemies and it opens its mouth in blasphemy against God. His name, his tabernacle, his people. What is blasphemy? It's the act or offense of speaking sacrilegiously about God or sacred things. It's profane talk. And we see that in the process of time, there is a kingdom that will try to force or cause people to worship in a particular way. This power uses signs and wonders to deceive people on the earth and validate its theology. The interesting thing about this sign is that it's described as fire from heaven. This is the same sign that was used by Elijah to confirm that God was with him on Mount Carmel. 
you can see the logic. If God answers by fire, whatever is being said must be true. But listen to the words of Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So shall you put away the evil from your midst. So how do you not get deceived? You fall in love with the truth, the truth of the Bible. Because the lawless one, somebody that doesn't care about the commandments, somebody that doesn't follow the laws of God is going to come and deceive people. And the people that are gonna get deceived will have been the people that delight in wickedness. You remember the verse in Matthew 7, 22 and 23? Jesus says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, have done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practiced lawlessness. I think that stamping an image of Jesus into everybody's mind that does not care about your behavior is setting people up for the false Christ they will be a class of people that think they're doing God's will. Lord, didn't we prophesy? Didn't we do all these amazing things in your name? That's a class of people that believe in God, but they delighted in wickedness and lawlessness. Do not let this movie put an image in your mind that Jesus does not care about your behavior. When the Bible talks about a time of lawlessness, they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, the power to have freedom and victory over sin. That's what Jesus does in our life. He can set us free. But if you just have a form of godliness and you say, hey, I got, I'm got, i wearing a cross, I hold a Bible, I go to church every week, I'm a Christian, but you don't see the fruit. You don't see that transformation, the renewing of the mind, then that's just a form of godliness. In Luke 5.32, it says, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Repentance and turning away from sin is a theme that runs throughout the Bible. When the woman was caught in adultery, Jesus said, go and sin no more. Turn away from that. Don't just keep continuing. It doesn't matter what you do. Uh, the Bible tells us we need to cease from sin, turn away from it, and turn our hearts back to God. Listen to what it says in Luke 15, 7. I say unto you likewise that there will be much joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 persons who need no repentance. In Luke 24, 47, it says, and repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance and a turning away from sin is literally what Jesus was wanting us to preach. The very stamp of heaven is obedience. Those that follow what God is asking them to do. Doing what God asks you to do has always been the test. Could the world potentially be watching something that is in sheep's clothing? Opening the door for a false Christ. According to the creators, the point of reference isn't biblical. The characters are from the Bible, but the storyline is fiction. Trying to appeal to everyone all at once in this ecumenical movement in a loose, watered-down version of the gospel. The fact that Jesus downplays the rules. And if we know where this thing is actually going prophetically, the end of the world, we see a group and a class of people that follow the rules. Sin ruined this world because someone believed the lie that God would not take 
their behavior into account. So with all these things and, and probably more, what does that leave us with? Entertainment? All right, well, fair enough. But I can assure you that the book is better. <laughs> <laughs>